We've all seen the headlines. A confrontation between a police officer and a civilian that ends in tragedy and often community outrage. Each incident widens the divide between police officers and the communities they serve. This year, John Jay College launched a year-long initiative aimed at bridging that divide. The intriguing subtitle was Reimagining Police Community Relations. The initiative has produced new insights and understanding, and most importantly, created a more collaborative channel of communications on the part of New Yorkers and the police. In today's special episode of Criminal Justice Matters, we offer a taste of what those conversations have been like. In the first segment, we feature Dr. Lenore Fulani, founder of New York's justly acclaimed All Stars Project. Dr. Fulani uses participatory theater to show how cops and kids can bridge the divide with humor and empathy. In the second segment, students and faculty at John Jay were asked to respond to the question, what is justice? I think you'll find their answers compelling. Let's listen in. Angry mobs ran through Crown Heights. Rocks and bottles were thrown, shots fired. It all happened after a car driven by a Hasidic Jew jumped a curb. A seven-year-old black girl on a bicycle was killed. Her seven-year-old cousin seriously injured. The Hasidic community says that as revenge for the accident which killed the young boy, a Hasidic man, a Jewish man, was stabbed to death two hours later. They say it was revenge, but of course there are no hard and true facts here. There is just tension, there is just passion. And you can see behind me the police at the 71st Precinct clearly mobilizing at this hour. I went out into the community the following day to be with the community in its upsetness. And on the streets outside of the Cato home were about 100, 150 police officers lined up in riot gear. At some point, I realized that the young black men, teenagers, were picking up rocks and stones and bottles and lining up preparing to rush the police. I called Dr. Newman, sharing with him my concern about the, what the kids were about to do. He suggested that I go out and speak to some of the women on the streets and ask them to join me in intervening on the situation. I did. And people said to me, Dr. Fulani, I respect you, but I'm not about to get in the midst of that battle. I then, at some point, with the two people who were there as my security, went into the streets and for four hours, using some combination of mother wit and cursing and yelling, got the kids to back down. And one of the things that stayed with me was that in response to my saying to the kids that they were going to get slaughtered, they kept shouting at me that they had nothing to live for. Their responses broke my heart, and when they finally dispersed, I vowed to myself that I would come continue to strengthen my work with them at the All Stars. It also turned out that many of the officers, some who had been promoted to higher office, were out on the streets that day. So when I began running the program, Cops and Operation Conversation Cops and Kids, they would come up to me and thank me for preventing what would have been a street riot and applauded the work that I was doing with the cops and kids. Dr. Filetti, welcome. Hi, it's so great to be here again with you. It's great <laughs> to have you. So performance, what does that have to do with justice? Well, I mean, basically, even though we don't think about it in this way, people, all kinds of people, we perform our lives. We learn how to approach things. We have various responses. And it's not as if they're innate. And so at the All Stars Project, which uh, I helped to co-found 30-some-odd um, years ago, <laughs> we understand that performance allows for human beings to do things that they normally don't know how to do, to take risks, to basically step outside of whatever their personality is or what they think their personality is, and do all kinds of creative things in the world. And it's how babies develop. It's not like babies have all of these thoughts about, I'm going to walk, I'm going to crawl, I'm going <laughs> you know, to play with my toys. They do new things, and in the process of doing that, they grow and expand. So you have kids coming together with cops, basically, mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're playing their roles, real life roles, in a way. How does that actually work? Basically, um, I create an opportunity at some point um, 
early in the process of doing these workshops where the young people and the police officers do skits together. Curtain up. Kids, what kind of pets do you want? Um, I want a tiger. A tiger. A tiger. That. This is a small. This white one. A white one. Too. One bathroom, Green. one kitchen. I don't uh, think we have this space. A tiger can sleep in your bedroom. I have a big backyard. Uh, Could escape. I don't know. Yeah. Alligator. I want an alligator. Alligator. We have a big pool back there. So uh, I think we're gonna in. need a moat. As I said, the rent's already too high. One Alligator's bathroom cool too. Too. Is no one concerned about injuries from wild animals? No. Our family lives on the edge, so we're, we're welcome. Yeah, yeah. Um, alligator, tiger. Yeah. White one. Oh, okay. Tony. Uh, Tony the tiger. That's actually, a, that's pretty cool. I'm not, like a, fan, Let's do it. I'm not a fan of frosted flakes. Um, you, what, what do you want? Uh, how about a dog? <laughs> <laughs> they have this ridiculous and absurd conversation, <laughs> and they perform. and together and in the process one of the things that it does is it humanizes one to the other because the young people don't think that cops have a sense of humor they have all this uh, all these ideas about who they are and what they can do and so when mm -hmm. they see the police officers sort of falling over themselves in laughter and literally being silly they sort of love it and we do that before we do the conversation part of the workshop because it creates an environment where people are able to hear each other and um, also to think new thoughts and ask creative questions. And, and what is it they hear? Well, do you think? in the course of the conversation, um, the two of the questions that make a really big difference is first of all, I ask the kids to say, what's the worst thing that's ever happened to them in their lives? The worst thing that's ever happened to me. Um, I'd have to say, watching my grandfather get pulled out of the car and arrested for no reason. He came home and he's, there was no, there was no reason. It was just, he, he fit the description. I want you to repeat the story that you just shared with us. And officer, I want you to empathize with what you just said. Um, my father passed away when I was six years old of a heroin overdose. Um, I found out uh, the day my mom found him uh, I was at a friend's house and I was staying over, and uh, she just told me, you know, dad passed away. I'm sorry to hear that. I know you're going through high school. I lost one of my best friends for heroin overdose as well. It was probably one of the saddest days of my life. I'm sorry. Shake hands. Moment. Thank you. Thank you. Our kids live in poor communities. They live in poverty, and every, you know, five minutes something goes wrong. So the kids talk about the deaths of people that are close to them. They talk about the incarceration of their fathers, sometimes their mothers. They talk about not having food and a variety of other kinds of things that even though- Can the though, cops relate to that? Well, it's, yes. I mean, first of all, I think that some of the cops have come out of poverty mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and at least working class homes. But I think they don't necessarily think about that when they're patrolling the communities, even the cops who have grown up in the poor communities. So it actually penetrates. Um, the kids have like unbelievable stories. And then the cops on the other hand, when I ask them what's the hardest thing about being a cop, they talk about not being home with their families. They talk about being criticized by their families because they've become cops. They miss holidays. And because kids are kids, I think one of the things that really um, impacts them when they, is when a cop says, I haven't been home for Christmas in nine years. So then that creates, That's interesting. yeah, it creates the possibility to go new places and have new kinds of conversations. But this is in, this is in a protected environment, a theater setting. How does it translate when they get back out into the streets? Well, it's actually, a lot of it happens at the PAL Center or it happens at my center on 42nd Street right. or it happens in a school. It happens in the communities for the most part. And it's not so far from reality. I mean, when the cops walk in, the kids have, you know, their, they have their response to that and the cops have their response to the kids. Because they're in uniform, right? The cops yes, come and in they, uniform. they're armed, they're cops. And they come I with have, guns as well. Yes, they come as cops. And I have them sit in a circle, cop, kid, cop, kid, so they can't really avoid each other. <laughs> the mm -hmm. kids uh, are sitting next to them. And I think it's an experience 
that I know it is that neither of them has ever really had before mm -hmm. um, and conversations that they've never had before and the reports that I get from both the young people and the police officers is that when they're back out on the streets they take some of what they've learned and done um, in the workshop with them. So for Do they example, see the same officers or will they see the same officer on the street when they go home and sometimes, then change their attitude? Towards sometimes them? yes because the officers come from a nearby precinct. So what happens when they see each other out on the streets? I think they've learned that they can do a different kind of performance. I think it also impacts upon the uh, familiarity of one to the other because it's a very intimate setting. It's a kind of setting that they've never been in. And I get reports from the kids and the cops of how they've done something different together and even with strangers. I mean, one of the things that police officers oftentimes um, complain about is that when they're in the communities and the, uh, a parent and their kid walk by and they say hello, nobody ever says hello back. So then they stop saying hello. And now, does it change? Does it actually well, what change changes is, is that they don't take it so personally and I told them to keep saying hello and at some point people will say hello. But if you get, you know, an attitude <laughs> because people won't speak to you, then that has an impact on whether or not they will ever speak to you. And also that's not the biggest thing that's going on. You know, there's so much baggage right now in the relationship between cops and the community that, and we just have to look at the headlines to understand what's been happening around the country. Hard to imagine that just getting them together and saying, learning how to say hello to each other is enough to overcome this baggage, which some people actually would argue goes back centuries. Well, as an African American, I surely wouldn't argue against that. But I think the thing that um, the workshop helps the cops and kids look at is that what really is a problem in poor communities of color and probably also in white poor communities, but we don't hear that much about this there, is poverty. A lot of what police officers are assigned to do is to navigate all the many things in our communities mm -hmm. that don't go well. The school system is dysfunctional. I work with kids who take Regents exams in chemistry and they've never seen a science book. Um, there, you know, there's a listing of the hundred worst high schools <laughs> in the city. The schools don't work. And that's not a cop problem, that's a political problem, that's a politician's problem, that's an educator's problem. And unless we do something about that, that's a big deal. And it's a larger problem really than when we think about justice, we think about criminal justice, cops and kids in the street. Uh, officer-involved shootings, but you're really talking about a much larger concept of what justice is. Absolutely, and it shapes all, it shapes the overall environment in huge ways. I have kids who come to my workshops, various places, to, to the All-Stars, and say to me, Dr. Falani, I didn't eat for the last few days because we only had enough food for my little sister and I wanted her to eat. So that's pretty it's extremely upsetting and also if you're walking around and you're not eating that has an impact a lot the kids don't even know what they're angry about I work with kids who've been in gangs who walk out on the streets and they are so pissed off but they don't even know what it is and what it really comes down to is in my opinion an abandonment of poor people in this country and then we send the police officers in to manage all of that and you need a social worker and jobs <laughs> in order to manage all Some of that. Some cops would argue the same, in fact. Do you think we can ever get past this? Are you optimistic that we can get to the next stage where people can actually understand some of the roots um, of these justice issues? Well, yes, and some of it has to do, I think, with engaging the political establishment, and they're functioning more as leaders in our community and working with the community in better ways. I think it's a political issue. And you've been a politician yourself in your earlier days. Well, I think of myself uh, not as hopeful? a politician, but as a, a leader. I'm a political, a political leader, I'm a psychologist, uh, I'm many things, and I've, uh, I grew up poor. I watched, the, my, I had 12 nieces and nephews, six of them are dead. I've, my father died you know, when I was 12 because an ambulance service refused to come into the poor black community to take him to the hospital. 
So I have experiences like many ordinary other black and Latino and poor white people in this country that really have a tremendous emotional impact. So in order for the street to change, I think the country has to go through a very critical and important change relative to how it relates to poor people overall and how it relates to the black community. We still have not been integrated into American society. That's a big, 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 big deal. Dr. Kalani, thanks so much for joining us today. You're deeply welcomed. If we are truly serious about justice and educating for justice, the work will never end. Seriously engaging with justice is a full-time job. Some of you may be wondering at this point, what does any of this have to do with policing? The Bridging the Divide initiative is, after all, primarily about policing. This is more or less one of the questions that I'll ask our panelists to address, and I'm eager to hear their thoughts about it. Without going into too many specifics, part of the backstory driving my concern was, of course, the horribly tragic and profoundly unjust killings of Eric Garner, Michael Brown, and, as we're all too pain painfully aware, the list goes on. Are we doing everything we possibly can as an institution to ensure that our students will go forth into the world with something like a critical understanding of and commitment to justice, as opposed to, say, simply being prepared to get a job in the justice system? And in particular, are we doing so with respect to students who go on to work in fields in which they will possess immense powers. In the case of the police, the power to take away liberty, and as we've seen, even life. What does justice mean to you? And I'm, of course, I'm addressing that to all the panelists here. Justice would be uh, breaking through any sort of oppression the communities face on a daily basis. Uh, to me, justice means putting aside gender, socioeconomic background, as well as race under the law. I think that's a really important thing that definitely highlights to me when I talk about what justice means. Um, what I've strived to do in all of the classes that I teach here, again, I'm an economist, and one might say, well, what does an economist have to teach about justice? Well, I try to make sure, and I think my students could attest to this, that when I'm teaching them, I always teach about what, first of all, the historical context within which there are disparities in the country. The why is it that we have a nation that is an outlier in compared to the rest of the world uh, regarding the rate at which we incarcerate people and the sheer number of people we have behind bars? I try to teach my students not only about who's dealing with poverty, but why. And so um, my job is to facilitate their understanding of what has proceeded and what feeds into injustices because they're gonna, they're, they are currently citizens of the world and they're gonna go out and continue to be citizens of the world. So I feel that part of my job is not just to instruct them and provide them the basic tools um, within the economics discipline, but to go beyond that and to provide them with the understanding, the information, the history of disparities in this country that Dr. Falani talked about that leads to uh, things like black on black crime, um, things like police brutality, things like uh, racism, discrimination, sexism, homophobia. And so uh, from that angle, as an educator, I take that role and that responsibility in terms of teaching very seriously. Well, when it comes to justice, uh, I, I, I take a, a broader scope uh, and I, I think of righteousness. I think of the difference between right and wrong. And it's a very fine line, but it's, that's what we look at. As fierce advocates for justice, we, we look at these principles and we try to find where we should stand. Uh, of course, justice includes a pursuit for truth. Uh, and that's something that, that, that really has to be held as a principle when we speak about justice. Um, when we speak about justice, it, it involves clarity, it involves transparency, uh, and it involves knowledge, no, knowing what has occurred in the past, as uh, Professor Holder, Holder mentioned earlier, uh, learning about that history. Um, and we can see that in our history, it's a, it's a bit opaque and covered in, in just grime. And that's something that we need to be, be aware of if we want to pursue justice. Um, I, I would have to agree with all of the, pa the panelists. Um, 
I think what I would add to the commentary is that <clears throat> I was um I was wrestling with this question last night and I I think what's really really important approaching it from a more creative aspect is that um justice would be collaboration not domination. What would educating for justice look like and a radically more just future? Uh honesty um, and the truth is very ugly. Most, in my opinion, from what I've gathered, people's, it's, it's, it's you know, it's, uh, it's politically correct to say I want to hear the truth, but a lot of people don't want to hear the truth, especially in America. That's uh, from my, my, my firsthand experience. And um, you have to be honest. And, you know, given, I just speak in terms of America because that's where we're at. It's, it's ugly. America is ugly. Um, even still, you know, um, thank God I'm, I'm a lot more educated so I can, I can navigate through these uh, obstacles a little better than my, 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 my average peer. But, I, like, I, ha I have, you know, like, I have friends that, you know, they probably won't be here by the summer. You know what I mean? That's just um, probably some of you in the, in the, in the crowd. And that, uh, that goes to, you know, incarceration, uh, death, you know, just a number of things, you know. So that may not be everybody's reality, but... If we, I, 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 I like to liken it to a chain and I'll wrap it up, wrap it up on this. You're, you're only as strong as your weakest link. So if we're, as Americans, we've been just praising our strongest links and forgetting our weakest links, there's no chain. There's no solidarity. So what you have is the exclusion of marginalized people and um, oppressed people. And you, the thing is, you know, the system does a real good job of covering that up and whatnot, but then you'll have a Ferguson happen, you'll have a Sandra Bland happen, you'll have uh, Trump happen, you know, like, <laughs> y it, it's gonna pop up. You can't hide, the, the truth will always come to the light. All right, uh, I wanna bring it back to what Professor Rowan said earlier, uh, is having a, this critical introspection where we dive in within ourselves and we look inside and we really know who we are. Um, and that's something that in this institution and many others like it, that, that opportunity is not, it's not present. Uh, we tend to be uh, very separated from, from what we're studying. And, and we don't see ourselves in those texts. We don't see ourselves in the oppression that's going on in, within what we're reading. So this has, there has to be some kind of connection with what we're doing. Uh, so aside from that critical introspection and self-awareness, uh, we need to be aligned with the truth. Uh, and and that will happen in, 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 that, in the same process when we Really, when we really critically uh, go within, we start to align ourselves with, with the truth and, and we start to see uh, patterns in the external, patterns uh, outside. You start to walk, when you take a class that really questions your, your, your values or makes you question your values, and you step outside and then you start, you start to see injustices everywhere. It just happens. And then you start to you know, pinpoint where, you, where things could change everywhere. Especially being in a classroom, we actually sit by students who have, have had experience with law enforcement, whether it's negative or positive. And we learn through that. And I think that's very important, especially in John Jay. I'm not sure about other institutions, but this is what I'm taking from being at John Jay, that I get a personal, more relationship with those who have, in fact, encountered law enforcement rather than just reading it in the news or just hearing stories about it. I just want to tie back to what was said over there about uh, aligning with the truth. And I think that with Educating for Justice, it really takes a step in uh, stepping out of your comfort zone and really understanding what is going on. And I think that I think maybe just my experiences with professors have been lucky, but I've been able to have those conversations and really understand maybe my thinking and shape my own ideas to understand what is going on, why I shouldn't ignore the things that are happening in society today. Um, and I would just add to uh, what Yulia said um, and Yishe said and uh, all the panelists have already said. And again, um, being one of the two seniors on the panel, um, uh, I, and because there are so many students in the audience, I think that's in, it's important for me to talk about 
how I see educating for justice from my perspective as, as an educator. So Mike, if you wouldn't mind in, indulging me. So uh, this is something I wrote um, as part of my, what m might have been my formal presentation here, but it really speaks to the question that Mike just posed. So I'll just briefly read it. So my job, as I mentioned before, is to facilitate learning. And in all the courses that I teach, I make a central part of my teaching to expose and discuss issues of justice, unfairness, disparate treatment, and what can be done to address these things. For example, in my crime class and capital capitalism class, I help un students understand what journalist Mike Taibbi calls the great divide, meaning how there appears to be two different approaches to justice for the rich and the poor. Witness the atrocities of stop and frisk in New York City versus the fact that no executive in any of the largest banking firms involved in the subprime mortgage crisis was ever indicted on a crime. In my political economy of racism class, I teach about the roots of racism in the US, the manifestations of it in the present day, and what could be done to combat it. My approach to quote unquote educating for justice is to first recognize that the students I'm teaching are and will be, as I mentioned before, citizens of this world. And so I must do my part. It is my responsibility as an educator to s equip them with the knowledge and skills to, to contribute to a more just world where prosperity is shared more equi equitably, where violence has no place, and where peace needs to be the first goal of security. I recognize that many of my students will be going into law enforcement as police officers, as beat cops, as Dr. Uh, Falani mentioned, part of the military, maybe even the FBI. And I always say to them, remember what you learn in my class. Remember how I showed you very clearly how some of the communities you will be policing came to be poor, disenfranchised, and suspicious and scared of law enforcement. My mantra to my students who I know will be going into law enforcement is, remember what I tried to teach you, to show you about the world where discrimination still happens, where single mothers with children are among the poorest demographic in the US, where America became an outlier compared to the rest of the world regarding the degree to, wit it, to which it incarcerates its people and who those people are that are getting locked up. Where did they come from? What did they do and why? I know that's a bit of a long speech, but this is what I try to do with my students who I know will be going into law enforcement here at this college, as I try to do with all of my students. No one pretends that just discussing these difficult issues will produce the kind of change in policy and approach that many New York communities want to see. As community advocates and the students themselves would say, we need a lot more than talk. But the past year shows what can happen when both sides really sit down and try to put their preconceived notions aside. Please visit John Jay's Bridging the Divide website and check out videos from our events throughout the year. Tell us what you think. I'm Steve Handelman. Thanks for watching. See you next time.